Hey guys, welcome to video 40. Today we're going to talk about a device you may have heard of, the Junction Field Effect Transistor, or JFET. On the left side of the screen, I've got the schematic symbols for the two types of JFETs available, the N channel, which is similar to an NPN bipolar transistor, and the P channel, which is similar to a PNP transistor. Also similar to bipolar transistors, you're going to see way more N channel devices out there in the world than P channel. So we're going to concentrate on N channel devices in this presentation. The terminals of the JFET are the drain, gate, and source, and these are analogous to the collector, base, and emitter of a bipolar transistor. On the right hand side we've got the cross section of an N channel JFET. It's called an N channel because when current flows down from drain to source it flows through this central N type channel. Now these two P regions on either side of the channel are what we're going to use to indirectly control the current flow down through this device. Remember anytime we have a PN junction we're going to have an associated depletion region which I'll represent with these dashed lines surrounding the P regions. All right, even though we do have depletion regions here, and remember a depletion region is an area that has no uh, free charge carriers available, it's an insulating region, we still have this conductive channel down through the center. So if we were to apply a bias voltage to this device, uh, we would get drain current flowing down through. And we'd also get a voltage gradient across the device as well. So one thing we can tell right now is that the JFET is a normally on device. We don't have to bias it up to turn it on. It's on automatically. All right. Uh, field effect transistors that operate this way are called depletion mode devices because when we uh, bias it up, we're going to restrict the end type channel that uh, controls current flow down through the device. So they're depletion mode devices. Uh, contrast this with a bipolar transistor, which is a normally off device, and we have to bias it up to turn it on. So you could think of a bipolar transistor as an enhancement mode device. Okay, now uh, I'm going to come over to the next page and I want to show you a circuit we'll use to develop some characteristic curves for this device. Okay, so over here we've got an N channel JFET, and on the left side I've got VGG, which is a bias voltage. It applies a negative voltage to the gate with respect to the source, and what that does is reverse biases these PN junctions. So we're going to use this source to control the size of the depletion regions and indirectly the current flow down through the device. On the right hand side we've got VDD which is equivalent to VCC in a bipolar transistor circuit and it's used to control the drain to source voltage VDS. All right, let's uh, start by sketching the inherent depletion regions around these uh, P-type regions in the transistor and we'll start with VGG and VDD both set to zero so we're down here at the origin of our graph. Now I'm going to leave VGG set to zero, so we have no bias on the transistor, that is VGS equals zero, and I'm going to start increasing VDS. And what's going to happen is we are going to get current flow down through the JFET, and the higher VDS is, the greater the voltage gradient across the device is as well. And what that's going to do is distort these depletion regions, stretching them up and in. Okay, and the higher we turn up VDS, the more uh, voltage gradient we have across the device and the more it distorts these fields, these depletion regions, until eventually we have a high enough VDS and drain current flowing through that the depletion regions actually touch in the center and they pinch off the conduction channel here. Now it doesn't block the drain current. What it causes is the drain current to level off, okay? And that's the most drain current that we can get through this device. Uh, these fields will counteract any further increase in drain current, okay? So if we were to graph ID versus VDS, what we would get in this case is pretty much a linear change in drain current with VDS until these two depletion regions touch and pinch off the channel where we're in what's called pinch off in this device. Okay, so let me pull this over just a bit. 
Uh, the voltage required to cause this pinch off with no bias applied is called the pinch off voltage, V sub P, pinch off voltage. And the current that we reach when we uh, have maximum drain current is called IDSS. That means drain current with the gate shorted to the source. Yeah, I know it's kind of a cumbersome thing, but we're just going to call it IDSS. That's the maximum drain current we can get to flow under normal conditions. And this is generated with VGS equals zero volts. All right, now suppose we turn VDD and VDS back down to zero and we apply a slight negative bias to the gate. What that's going to do is cause an initial depletion region that's larger than the last time. And that means as we increase VDS and drain current, the uh, channel is going to pinch off sooner. Okay, it takes less voltage and current to cause these uh, depletion regions to meet. And what happens is we get a curve something like this, let's say. Okay, we pinch off sooner and uh, the voltage required to do that might be say VG equals negative 0.5 volts or so, okay? And we can repeat this process, uh, applying more and more uh, bias to the gate of the device. And eventually we'll reach a point where we've applied enough voltage that the depletion regions meet without any external VDS being applied. And we get zero drain current or just leakage current. And the uh, VGG or VGS required to achieve that is called VGS off. So at this curve, we have VG S equals VGS off. All right. Now we've got three parameters for this JFET. We've got IDSS, which is the maximum drain current that we can get with VGS equal to zero. We've got VP, the pinch off voltage required to uh, pinch off the channel when we've got zero bias applied. And we've got VGS off, which is the bias voltage required to pinch off the channel under no drain current conditions, okay? Now, one of the things I wanna note here is that it happens that VP and VGS off have the same magnitude. They're just opposite polarities. VGS off is a negative voltage and VP is a positive voltage, but VGS off equals negative VP. And it's just something to keep in mind. It makes using the formulas a little bit easier sometimes to use a positive value instead of a negative one. All right, now what I'd like to do is compare these curves with the collector curves of an NPN transistor because they do look similar. And uh, what we're gonna find is that, uh, well, if we compare apples to apples, a uh, transistor like a 2N3904 with a JFET like an MPF102, they're designed to be used in similar applications. Uh, we're going to find that, uh, number one, the saturation voltage VCE sat for a bipolar transistor is very small compared to the pinch-off voltage of a JFET. Uh, for an MPF-102 or similar, a typical pinch-off voltage is around 2 volts. VCE sat for a bipolar is about 0.2, so we have a tenfold difference between these two, and that can be important in some applications. And there are JFETs that have much higher pinch-off voltages than this as well. I mean, you can get a JFET that has a pinch-off voltage as low as, say, 0.5 volts or so, or as high as 5 or 6 volts or more. And uh, that's got to be taken into account when you're uh, using it in certain applications. Now, in this particular example, I'm assuming IDSS is about 10 milliamps for the JFET. And that's pretty common for these types of devices. Um, so, you know, these are, are what we're going to typically use when we do uh, analysis with these devices, because I'll specify these. But you can get JFETs that have IDSS uh, that ranges from as low as 1 or 2 milliamps to as high as 20, 30 milliamps or more. So it all depends on the device you're using, and there's a pretty wide range of these parameters available. All right, now also notice that these curves tilt just like the uh, bipolar transistors do. So there is an early voltage associated with the JFET just like there is for a bipolar transistor, okay? Now, uh, 
What I want to look at next is the transconductance curve of the JFET. This is the uh, graph of drain current as a function of VGS, the bias voltage applied from gate to source. And this is a parabolic curve, sometimes called a square law curve, and it's given by Shockley's equation for JFETs, which is over here. It says ID equals IDSS, the maximum drain current, times 1 minus VGS, the applied bias from gate to source, divided by VGS off, the quantity squared. So because it's squared, this is a, a parabola. And if you compare that to a bipolar transistor, remember collector current is exponentially related to VBE for those devices. So if we consider them both to be voltage controlled, and that is what a JFET is, they are definitely voltage controlled devices. Uh, one is a square law device, the JFET, and the bipolar transistor is an exponential device. So it's a pretty big difference, and that'll be important in some applications we'll see down the line. All right, now uh, remember VP and VGS off are the same magnitude, and IGSS is another parameter, and that's basically just the leakage current of these reverse biased PN junctions. It's going to flow out from the gate to the VGG source, and typically it's in the nanoamp range, so we're gonna just consider it to be zero most of the time. All right, so there really is no gate current in uh, a JFET. If there is, it's just leakage current, and it has no real effect on the gain or the transconductance of the device, okay? It's purely a voltage-controlled device, a voltage-controlled current source. All right, now, what I want to do is uh, tie some of this information together with a couple of problems. I know this is a tough one. This is very heavy theory. And believe me, I feel your pain. And uh, I'm going to try and make this as efficient as I possibly can. So let's work a couple problems right now. All right. On the left here, we've got a JFET with 15 milliamps IDSS, negative three volts for VGS off, and that means its VP value is positive three volts, okay? And what we wanna do is determine its Q point. So all we're gonna do here is plug these numbers into the Shockley's equation and see what we get. Remember that's ID equals IDSS times one minus VGS divided by VGS off the quantity squared. Okay, so let's call up our calculator. We'll plug these numbers in. VGS is 1.2, negative 1.2, but I'm going to use the magnitude. So we've got 1.2 divided by VGS off, which is 3. So we've got 0.4 for this fraction. 1 minus 0.4 is 0.6. So the fraction, or this quantity in parentheses, is 0.6 squared which is 0.36 times IDSS, which is 15 milliamps. So we've got an IDQ of 5.4 milliamps. All right, the resulting VDSQ we find by subtracting this drop, ID times RD from the power supply. So what we've got is, uh, whoops, VDSQ is equal to VDD minus IDQ times RD. Okay, and let's see what we've got here. Um, let's see, 12 minus uh, 0 0.0054 times 820 equals, uh, let's call it 5 or 7.6 volts. Okay, so we're going to have a VDSQ of about 7.6 volts. Is that a good Q point? Well, as long as VDSQ is less than VDD and greater than VP, we're going to be okay. And similarly, as long as IDQ is greater than zero and less than IDSS, we're fine too. All right, now let's look at this problem. What we want to do is figure out the VGG value required to bias this trans transistor up as shown. So let's look at it first from the perspective of voltage. We've got nine volts dropped across the JFET. So that means we're gonna to have to have six volts dropped across the drain resistor. And using Ohm's law, that re gives us a required drain current of six volts divided by two K ohms, which is three 
milliamps. So our Q point is going to be ID equals 3 milliamps with VDS equal to 9 volts. All right, but now what we have to do is solve this equation for VGS in order to figure out what we need to bias it up properly. So let's do that. First, let's start by dividing both sides by IDSS. So that gives us ID over IDSS equals 1 minus VGS over VGS off the quantity squared. Now let's take the square root of both sides to get rid of this uh, exponent of 2 and then we've got the square root of ID over IDSS equals 1 minus VGS over VGS off. All right, and if we subtract both sides from, or but one from both sides and multiply by negative one, we're going to get one minus the square root of ID over IDSS equals VGS over VGS off. And if we multiply both sides by VGS off, we finally end up with VGS equals VGS off times 1 minus the square root of I sub D over I D S S. And this will tell us the VGS we require to get this Q point. So let's just plug our numbers in here. What is my calculator? And let's see, we've got I D over I D S S. 3 milliamps divided by 6 milliamps is 0.5, right? So we've got the square root of 0.5 subtracted from 1. So let's just go 1 minus 0.5 square root equals times VGS off which is 2 volts or negative 2 and our required bias voltage is going to be negative 0.58 well, let's call it negative 0.6 volts okay negative 0.6 volts and that will appear over here right negative 0.6 volts and remember we have zero gate current so there's no voltage drop across the gate resistor so you know whatever we're biasing with out here applies right across the gate to source of uh, the transistor it's negative 0.6 okay now that was a little bit of work and it was a little bit painful but uh, we don't use this biasing arrangement very often it's kind of like using fixed base biasing with a bipolar transistor there are better ways to do this and that's what we're going to look at next we're going to look at a technique called source feedback biasing or self biasing. All right, and what we're going to do here is eliminate the need for the external biasing voltage altogether. And we do that by adding a source resistor to the circuit. What's going to happen is when we turn the transistor on, we get drain current, and that causes a voltage drop down here that's equal to ID times RS. And because we've got no voltage drop across the gate resistor, this gate is sitting at zero volts, so our VGS is equal to negative ID times RS. That is VGS equals negative ID times RS. And now when we want to determine the drain current, what we'd have to do algebraically is substitute this into Shockley's equation for VGS and use the quadratic formula to solve this and choose the right route. Now, I have to tell you that's a lot of work and it's very error prone and although it's kind of cool and I like the derivation and I want to show it to you sometime I don't want to do that today there this video is going to be long enough already so rather than do the algebraic approach to solving this we're going to do it graphically okay what we're going to do is plot this line which is a linear equation on this graph and find where it intersects with this uh, parallel parabola given by Shockley's equation and that'll be our solution okay so here's what I'm going to do I'm going to pick a drain current and find the resulting VGS okay and uh, let's start with the easiest drain current possible zero when I have zero drain current I've got zero VGS so that puts us right at the origin of this graph then let's pick another convenient drain current value and find that point on the graph and we'll connect them with a straight line and where the curves intersect that's our solution so how about if I just pick IDSS that's always a good guess 
usually it works okay. So let's say if I choose IDSS, that gives me a VGS of negative IDSS times RS. And what I'll do is find the coordinates of this point. We know it's IDSS, so it's going to fall along here somewhere. And let's just say arbitrarily that it's uh, right here, okay? This is where this point is located. So what we'll do then is draw a straight line between here and here, okay? And where these two curves intersect, that's our Q point. So what does it look like we have for a drain current here? Well, it looks like it's going to be 0 0.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, about 0.55 times IDSS, okay? 0 0.55 IDSS. And then we can come over here and uh, choose our drain resistor to give us whatever VDS we want based on this current, okay? So it's a relatively straightforward procedure. You know, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but let's do that next. Let's talk about uh, how this is applied here, okay? So I've got an N-channel self-biased uh, JFET with IDSS of 5 milliamps, VP is 1 volt, and that means VGS off is negative 1 volt, okay? So let's fill in those points on the graph. We've got 5 milliamps for IDSS, negative 1 volt for VGS off, and let's choose the most convenient point to start with, zero drain current, zero VGS, we're right here at the origin. And why not choose IDSS for our next current? That's five milliamps. And if we have five milliamps flowing down through this circuit, what drop are we gonna have across RS? Five mils times 100 ohms is 0.5 volts. But remember, VGS equals negative ID times RS. So we're gonna have negative 0.5 volts drop from gate to source. So let's find that on this graph, we're gonna find 5 milliamps and negative 0.5 volts on the graph, okay? Well, here's negative 0.5, it's halfway over. And IDSS is up here, so this is where the second point in our biasing line is going to be located. And we'll just connect these with a straight line. And this intersection is our Q point. Let's see what this drain current is, okay? It looks like it's about, what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0.55 times IDSS. So it's 0.55 times 5. 0.55 times 5 is 2.75. Let's just call it 2.8 milliamps, okay? 2.8 milliamps. We don't have to be super accurate because this is just a graphical approximation, and that's close enough. All right, so we know we've got 2.8 milliamps. All right, so VDS for this circuit is going to be uh, VDD minus ID times RD plus RS. Okay, and of course that's VDS. All right, so let's plug our numbers in and see what we get here. Okay, we've got ID of 2.8 milliamps, 0 0.0028 times 1.2K plus 100 is 1300, is 3.64, and we'll subtract that from 10, gives us a VDS of about 6.4 volts. So there's our Q point, 2.8 milliamps for ID, 6.4 volts for VDS. Is that acceptable? Well, uh, as long as VDS is greater than one volt and less than 10, we're okay. So there you go. That's a workable circuit. Let's do another one. All right, here's our second problem. This time our JFET has an IDSS of 12 milliamps and VP is 2.5 volts. So that means that VGS off is negative 2.5 volts. So let's fill these values in on our transconductance curve. 12 milliamps and negative 2.5 volts. All right, I'm gonna make the usual starting point for my negative ID times RS line. Uh, ID is zero, VGS is zero. So here is our first point. And again, I'm going to choose uh, ID equals IDSS, 12 milliamps. 
out of convenience here to determine my second point for this line. So 12 milliamps times 68 ohms, ID times RS is 0 0.012 times 68 is about 0 0.82 volts. So we're going to be dropping about 0 0.82 volts across RS. So that gives me a VGS of negative 0 0.82 volts. And let me find that on my horizontal axis. The easiest way to do that is to divide this voltage by the value of each of these minor divisions. So there, each of them is worth negative 0.25 volts. So I have to come over 0.82 divided by 0.25 is about 3.3 divisions. So I have to come over 3.3 divisions to find negative 0.82. So there's 1, 2, 3.3, and that's at 12 milliamps. So here's the second point for our line, and let's connect those points with our straight line and locate our Q point right about here. And that looks like about eh, maybe a third of the way between these two divisions. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six point three divisions. So it's 0 0.63 times 12. So 0 0.63 times 12 milliamps is, let's call that 7.6 milliamps. Okay, 7.6 milliamps. That's my drain current, 7.6 milliamps. All right, let's find our resulting uh, drain to source voltage. VDSQ equals VDD minus IDQ times RD plus RS. Bringing up our calculator, let's start inside the parentheses. RD is 560 plus 68 is 628 ohms times IDQ, so it's times 0 0.0076 is 4.77, subtract that from 12. Actually, I'm gonna subtract 12 and ignore the negative sign. So that gives us a VDS of about 7.2 volts, okay? So 7.2 volts. And is that a good Q point? Well, VDS is greater than VP, less than VDD, so yeah, we're okay. But one thing I should point out here, and I probably should have pointed this out in the previous problem, is that this voltage drop we have listed here. Remember, that's not for our Q point. That's associated with this point on the graph. So our actual ID times RS is going to be uh, whatever we have here. It's, uh, let's see, negative 0.5 volts on this graph. Okay, so we actually have 0 0.5 volts here. This is negative 0.5 volts. And uh, we could also get that by doing IDQ times RS, and it would give us the same value, or at least something really close. But anyway, I wanted to point that out just in case if you wrote this value in, it's only valid for this point, not for the Q point, okay? All right, let's go do one final problem. All right, here we go. This time we're gonna do a bit of design rather than analysis, but it's not really any harder. So uh, let's start by looking at what we want. We wanna determine RS and RD to give us an IDQ equal to IDSS over two. So that's 15 mils divided by two is 7.5 milliamps. And we want a VDSQ of eight volts. So we're gonna have eight volts here. All right, the way we uh, approach this problem is we're going to find our uh, drain current on our transconductance curve. So let me fill in the values here, 15 milliamps for IDSS, negative three volts for VP, and 7.5 milliamps is halfway up here. One, two, three, four, five, here we go. 7.5 milliamps. And what we do then is just come across to our transconductance parabola. That's gonna be our Q point, and we'll just drop down from there. And we've got three divisions over, so that's 0.3 per division, so 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 0 0.9. We got negative 0 0.9 volts for our drop across RS, okay? So we're gonna need 0.9 volts dropped across RS. So we can calculate RS now using Ohm's law, RS equals uh, 0 0.9 volts divided by 7.5 milliamps. And let's see what that gives us. 
0.9 divided by 0 0.0075 is 120 ohms. All right, so we need a 120 ohm source resistor, and that's a standard value. I like when that happens. It doesn't happen very often, but we need 120 ohms here. And now let's find the uh, required drain resistor value. To do that, we know that we're going to have to have uh, 15 minus 8.9 volts dropped up here. So 15 minus 8.9 is 6.1. So we have to drop 6.1 volts across RD. So using Ohm's law again, RD equals 6.1 volts divided by 7.5 milliamps. And let's see what that gives us. Okay, 6.1 divided by 0 0.0075 is 813 ohms. Okay, now that's not standard. So what we'd probably do is actually use the closest standard value, which would be 820. So I'd use 820 ohms here, and that would be good enough. And uh, there we go. So there's a design-oriented problem, and it's not really any harder than the analysis, but maybe a little bit more fun, to be honest. All right, now I know this was, again, another one of those long, tough slogs. And like I said before, I feel your pain. But uh, hey, we're covering a lot of really cool stuff. So, you know, it's I think it's all worth it. All right, now what I'm going to do here is leave you guys with a few problems to work, okay? And the first two are just determining the cue point of the source feedback biasing arrangements. And the last one is another design-oriented problem. I don't think you'll have any issues with this. Go back and do a screen capture of one of the transconductance curves, and you should be good to go. And uh, next video, I think we're going to tackle the JFET-based small signal amplifier stuff. So I think that'll be fun, and uh, you know, you'll enjoy it. And I'll see you next time.